Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. With all of this shock that we have, like four different shock, do we supposed to know what we supposed to do with the patient? Like put their heads up or heads down and yeah. this and that for the yes. exam? Yes. Okay. But they, I mean, but those are just the, the slight nuances. If you look at the um, what you're supposed to do as a clinician, you will see that the pattern over and over again is stop what you're doing, mm -hmm. get help, be ready to assist, take vitals every five minutes, don't leave the patient alone, comfort the patient. Right. Those are the basics. And then you'll have the slight nuances where flat, head up, right. no Trendelenburg. But I mean, those are just. They're, they're all very common, but there's only slight differences in what you need to do. So those are the ones that you really need to know. Okay, because everything else kind of yeah. repeats itself. Right. Okay. Yeah. Excuse me. Are those the medications the crash time? No. I, no I, I don't expect you guys to know that now. When you guys into the, get into the program, you're, you're going to be spending a lot of time on medication. Okay. Um, it may be also covered in your, um, your health uh, provider CPR, they may have touched on that a little bit, but when you guys get into the program, we spent actually about you know um, three to four sessions during the semester where we will be covering uh, um, advanced CPR as well as medication and life uh, life sustained procedures. Okay. So those slides, that's the ones, the medications. Yeah, just just look, just look it over. I don't I don't expect you to know the medications okay. right now, but look it over. I mean, you, you should. I mean, you should get an idea of what what is located in the crash cart. I mean, it's medicine, but medicine for what? And that's what I, I that's what I need you to understand. Hi. What's your name? Claudia. Okay. Got you. Uh, who else just walked in? What's your name? Davina. Gonzalez. Okay. All right, guys. So just a quick preview on shock. Remember the the definition of shock is um, an interruption or a disruption of blood supply to your body, your body's tissues and organs. It can either be isolated or it can be systemic. Um, also, the second part, the second part of the definition of shock is your body or your tissue's inability to perfuse the, the blood supply. And remember, the definition of perfusion is the exchange of gases, oxygen and carbon dioxide, as well as delivery of the nutrients and removing of any waste. Okay, so disruption of blood supply or your body's inability to perfuse, okay? What are the four main conditions of shock? Regardless of what the shock is, what are the four basic conditions? What happens to respiratory? Respiration. It goes up. It increases, okay? Because of the lack of oxygen that your uh, body's receiving, you start to breathe a little bit faster, okay? Because we're trying to intake some more oxygen. What else goes up? Heart rate. <laughs> heart rate. Heart rate's also gonna go up. Because again, because of the lack of blood supply to your body, automatically what's gonna happen is your heart starts to pump faster. Okay? But because your heart pumps faster, what's gonna happen to your blood pressure? It's gonna because drop. again, we're trying to even out the volume. What happens to blood pressure? It drops. It drops. Remember, they're inversely related. So if heart rate goes up, blood pressure is gonna go down to maintain the same amount of volume going to your body. So what happens if your heart rate goes, goes down? What happens to blood pressure? It goes up. It goes up, okay. And one last thing, your last condition. 
Urine what? Urinary output. Your urine output goes what? Down. Goes down. Because of the lack of blood supply going through your kidneys, your urine output is also gonna go down. Is there any questions? All right, so let's go ahead and continue on with anaphylactic reaction. Anaphylactic reaction is probably the one, this is the one type of shock that we are gonna be most concerned with. I mean, we're concerned with all of this, but this from happening is probably gonna, the likelihood of this happening in your department increases because we are dealing with contrast media that will increase the chances of an iodine reaction, okay? Iodine reaction is at the, the minor stages, okay? But, um, but iodine reactions can lead to anaphylactic reaction. We'll talk about iodine reactions later on. But basically what an anaphylactic reaction is, it is an exaggerated hypersensitivity uh, sensitivity to an antigen that was previously encountered by the body's immune system, okay? When that happens, <coughs> histamines start to kick up and bradykinins also kicks up. These all leads to, um, this all uh, leads to the influence on smooth muscle to contraction, especially in the respiratory tract and also the abdomen. We're gonna talk about this here in just a little bit, but I'm gonna just kinda give you a brief introduction of what anaphylactic shock is, okay? If you look at the first definition here, it's an exaggerated hypersensitivity reaction to, this is the key, an antigen that was previously encountered, previously, okay? Previously encountered. What that means, an, an, an antigen is basically a foreign body, okay? It's a foreign body that enters your body. Okay, it's foreign. Basically what this is, is that, here's my analogy. Let's just say for instance, you go on a trip. Okay, you go on a trip and you announce it on Facebook, you tell your friends and family, because this is a big, tri a big trip. So now everybody knows you are leaving your house. Okay, is that a good thing? Okay, because in doing so, what happens is you're also opening up, you're sending an invitation out there saying, you know what, I'm not gonna be here. So, feel free to come to my house and take whatever you want. Because this is what happens. So now what happens is, you've got robbers or burglars coming into your house, and they're gonna take everything. Okay, and now you're wiped out. They're taking your, your PlayStation, your Xbox, your food, your groceries, they've slept in your bed, they ate your porridge, they, s they sat on your chair, your favorite chair, okay? So they made use and took advantage of your house. Nothing happened, they get away clean free, okay? So the next time this happens, you're gonna be better prepared. You're gonna be better prepared. So now you're gonna have a security system, you're gonna have an alarm, you're gonna have a, a couple of 12 gauge shotguns, Okay? You're going to have a Rottweiler. You're going to have barbed wire. Do you understand where I'm going with this? Because the next time this happens, your house is going to be ready to defend itself. But in doing so, there's going to be some collateral damage. Okay, Because you can't just fire a shotgun without causing damage to maybe your sofa or the wall. Okay? You can't have barbed wire or Rottweilers without causing collateral damage to your home. Because as the Rottweilers are trying to jump on those burglars, they're also knocking down your vases and your lamps. Do you understand where I'm going with this? Okay, so this is what an anaphylactic reaction is. Your body first gets exposed to an antigen, nothing happens, nothing happens. However, in the second time it comes around, and your body is exposed to this antigen, you have what's known as an allergic reaction. Okay? That's what an allergic reaction is. The first time you're exposed to it, nothing happens. However, the second time it comes around, you are going to have a reaction. It may be mild, it may be moderate, it may even be severe. Okay? But there are different levels of this type of response. This is what an anaphylactic reaction is. 
Now, the release of histamines and bradykinins, they, the, the histamines attack the antigen. Okay? They try to diminish the amount of antigens in your body. So the response to that would be a cough, it would be a sneeze, it may be an itch. Okay? But that's how your body responds to these things. Now, the bradykinin, as well as the histamines, they act upon smooth muscle tissue. Smooth muscle tissue, which is found in your respiratory tract, okay, as well as your abdomen. So when someone's having an anaphylactic reaction, I'm not talking, to, let's not talk about mild, let's talk about moderate, somewhere in the middle. What happens here? Close. It's hard to breathe. It's hard having difficulty breathing <clears throat> because the smooth muscles in your air tract starts to constrict. What can also happen here is they start to sneeze, they start to cough, and then patients may also complain of, now listen to this, abdominal cramping. Okay? The abdominal cramping can become so severe that they start to throw up or they may have diarrhea. Okay? Again, it acts on the smooth muscle, so it causes this contraction, okay? Furthermore, what happens here is that uh, there is going to be um, hypotension. What's hypotension? Like low, okay. low blood when pressure. When your blood pressure goes down, when your blood pressure goes down, and then it causes vasodilation, okay? What should happen in a normal instance is that if your blood pressure goes down, your vessels should be tight. So that way you can pump blood adequately through your body. But if your blood pressure is down, again, there's no strength in pumping of the blood, and your vessels are wide open, what's going to happen to that blood flow? Sit there. It's going to sit there. It's not going to go anywhere. Yes, so what ha what's happening here, guys? Shock is going to happen. Okay, because the blood's not moving. So, um, causes vasodilation and then blood starts to pull. So this is what happens with anaphylactic shock. Okay, so some of the causes of anaphylactic shock is going to be medication, okay, so, and foods, okay, strawberries, peanut, eggs, shrimp. shrimp. Yeah. Who's allergic to fish and seafood? You allergic to shrimp? That sucks. I don't think penicillin, but I was, I was okay till I was, I was 19. Uh -huh. I used penicillin too much. Uh -huh. I was okay. Used, but I, when I was 19, when they tested under the skin, uh -huh. I couldn't breathe. Oh, and all of my body started to. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it, that's pretty bad. I think it's crazy how like some people don't develop an allergic reaction to like way later on in life. Some mm -hmm. they think. So, so that's what happens. Okay. So uh, Nick was just saying sometimes you know you know you're you're okay in, throughout your entire life and then all of a sudden you start to build these allergic reactions. It's because what's also happening is that as you get older, your immunity starts to drop. So that's another reason why you start having these allergic reactions. For one, so. All my life I had, I've had pets. I've always been around dogs. I've been around cats. I've been around other animals. And then when I, when I turned my 20s, whenever a dog was around me, my eyes would get watery, okay? I'd get itchy. My throat would start to get a little bit tight, okay? But I'm an animal lover, so what I do? I take Claritin, okay? <laughs> because I, I like being around them. Um, and another thing too, fish and seafood. I know I'm allergic to fish and seafood, but you know what I do anyways? I eat it. I still eat it because I know my body and I know the response to it. I have a minor breakout when I eat fish and seafood. So before I eat, I'm gonna take some Benadryl, okay? You're not gonna stop me from eating shrimp. <laughs> I love it, okay? So fish, seafood, and types of foods, medications, Insect venoms, if you have a bee sting, a hornet sting, a spider bite, any of those things. But most importantly, because we are dealing, we are dealing with contrast media, the main content in the contrast that we use when taking x-rays, certain type of x-rays, is iodine. Where is iodine found? 
fish and seafood. Okay? Salt. Yeah. So if if you are performing a procedure that is going to consist of an iodine contrast injection, what should you have immediate access to? Crash cart. The crash cart. Remember last week what I said, where are crash carts generally found? Contrast. I've In contrast. rooms where you perform contrast immediate <clears throat> procedures. Okay? So before we do any type of these procedures, we're going to take a very, very thorough history on our patient's background. Okay? So you have a patient come in, Ms. Jones, okay, so you know this is the type of procedure that you're having. Can you tell me if you have any allergies to fish and seafood? Okay? Do you have asthma? Do you have hay fever? Okay? Those type of things. Have you had a procedure before where you had contrast media? Okay? Can you tell me what happened? So if they tell me, oh, nothing happened, is that your is that a reason for you to drop your guard? No. no. Because remember, that may have been the first time your body was introduced to the antigen, and the next time they have an iodinated contrast study, what can happen? Allergic reaction. They can have an allergic reaction. <laughs> okay? So those are the things. If you have allergies to fish and seafood, any types of foods, any types of medications, asthma, hay fever, so on and so forth, the chances of that patient having an allergic reaction increases by two to three times. Okay? Have they ever lie about their situation? Would they ever lie? If they do, they're, they're in trouble. <laughs> I, don't see, I don't see why they would lie about that, but we we're still going to take precautions because they may not, may, may not be lying, maybe they just don't know. So they might not be able to give you full facts about their, their background or their history. But as clinicians, you still have to always be on guard. This is, this is a type of uh, situation that you never let your guard down because anything can happen from, you know, very simple to now something, it turns to something very complex and very life-threatening. Yes? What if they have a previous uh, like shock to iodinated contrast? What should I do? Say that again? What if they have a previous... Okay, so the question is, well, what would happen if they've had a previous uh, allergic reaction in the past? Well, if they have, we, we usually note it. It's usually in the chart. And when the chart comes up, we're alerted to it. And not only that, this is again where you have to ask your patient, have you ever had a, a previous study? What happened? And if they tell you, well, this is what happened, okay, that's a red flag. So now you need to be uh, you need to re, um, uh, be assured that the night before that they take any type of premedication. Generally, now what's happening in the hospitals is that if the patient is going to be having one of these iodinated uh, tests, the night before they will take different types of steroids. Okay, they'll take steroids. So it could be in the form of a prednisone, it can be in the form of uh, solucortef or solumedrol, those are different types of steroids, okay? Steroids are, are known to, uh, to have a reverse effect of somebody who's having an allergic reaction, okay? So we'll pre-medicate them. They may, we may also need to find them if they uh, had Benadryl the night before and the day of. So in other words, they do become pre-medicated prior to them having the study. Now, if they've had a severe reaction in the past, okay, we might not even do an iodine in the study. So it'll just be an, a regular x-ray study, but what happens here is that there's going to be a lot of loss of information. Okay? What I mean information is diagnostic x-ray information. There's going to be a lot of things that you can't see because we didn't uh, instill contrast in our patient. Okay? So, it all depends on the type of reaction they had in the past. And that will determine whether or not we are going to proceed with the procedure or do something else. Okay? So mild symptoms. We can go from mild to moderate to severe. With mild, the symptoms beginning, begin within two hours exposure to the antigen. They can be, there can be nasal congestion, paraorbital swelling, so swelling around the eyes, itching, sneezing, and tearing of eyes, peripheral tingling 
or itching at the site of the injection. Feeling of fullness or tightness of the chest, mouth, and throat. Now you also got to pay very close attention when we're performing these studies. Because as we are injecting our patient with contrast media, we are there next to the patient, making sure that they are not having any type of the symptoms. The moment that they tell me, hey, I'm having some trouble breathing, what are you going to do? Stop. Okay. Well, hold on. i got some more contrast to inject. <laughs> okay. can, you, can you hold that? Okay. Let me make sure I get all my contrasts in. How frequently are you guys, like, training your patients to make sure they're doing all right? Like, just <laughs> every, every, I mean, for me, I'm checking, like, every two to three minutes. Okay, at least for the first few minutes. Okay, because if you're gonna have a reaction, it usually happens immediately. Usually, can it happen later, guys? Yes. Yes, it can. And that's why you have to keep constant check of your patients. Okay, but generally it happens immediately. Okay. All right, so feeling of uh, fullness or tightness of the chest, mouth, and throat. The moment something like this happens, you need to be very, very, very cautious, okay? Because the next step might be, I'm gonna need to get the crash cart. I might need to do CPR, okay? Moderate, okay, so includes all the symptoms uh, above. However, this time it's a more rapid onset. There's going to be flushing, feeling of warmth, itching in urticaria. I think it's urticaria, isn't it? Urticaria. Let me fix that, guys. Urticaria. What's urticaria? Isn't it like itching yeah. or like Blood to the red swells or? Okay, yeah. So it's basically hives. So urticaria is hives. Yeah, swelling. Okay, maybe some uh, itchiness rash. Okay, a rash. But it's itching in urticaria. Now what's happening here is now. Remember what shock is. Now what's happening here is the blood pressure is going to drop. There's going to be some vasodilation. There's going to be a deficiency of blood flow. There's anxiety, right? Because there's no blood going to the brain, no oxygen going to the brain. Okay. Okay. So bronchospasm and edema of the airway is going to happen. Remember the histamines and the bradykinin. Now it's going to cause an effect on the smooth muscle tissue. Dyspnea, difficulty breathing cough and wheezing starts to occur because now your respiratory tract is also becoming constricted. All right. Severe systemic reaction, all of the above. However, now it's a sudden onset and the symptoms are even more prominent. Severe, this is what it says. There's going to be a decrease in your blood pressure there is going to be a rapid thready pulse. It's beating so fast, your heart's beating so fast, you can barely feel the pulse because it's beating so fast. Rapid progression to bronchospasm, laryngeal edema, severe dyspnea, and also severe cyanosis. Okay, this is an indication of severe shock. Okay, dysphagia, what's dysphagia? Dysphagia is unable to swallow. Abdominal cramping, vomiting, and now diarrhea. Seizures may happen. You're going to have respiratory and also cardiac arrest. <coughs> so, a few years ago, there was this patient in his early 40s. Healthy guy, very healthy guy, he was an athlete. He just went through a routine <coughs> procedure in nuclear medicine. It's called a treadmill test. So he goes to nuclear medicine. The patient is given some um, special type of contrast. It's not contrast that we're talking about here. This is a radioactive contrast because the studies that are done in nuclear medicine, have you guys ever heard of that um, modality? In nuclear medicine, the patients are injected with radioactive pharmaceuticals or radioactive medication. Okay. So the imaging is a little bit different. So they inject them with that. The patient goes on a treadmill, a treadmill, okay? And we do a, what's known as a heart, heart stress test, okay? So we, put the, we have the patient go on the treadmill. 
the patient's heart should start to beat a little bit faster, respiration go up, because we're putting the cardiopulmonary in stress. The patient's also hooked up to an AKG. Now we're gonna watch the AKG for patterns to see if there is any type of dysrhythmia, okay, or EKG changes to the heart rhythm, okay? And sure enough, he did, which meant that there was a possibility that there might be a heart blockage somewhere because the heart is working extra hard. Not only is the heart working extra hard, but the rhythm change, and when you have rhythm changes in your heart during stress, that's usually an indication that there's a blockage of the artery somewhere in the heart, okay? So that was this preliminary exam. So the next test, which is what we call the gold standard, is to have a heart catheterization. You guys heard of the cath lab, right? So the patient comes into the cath lab Okay, I was part of that team. So he comes to the cath lab. Again, healthy guy. We're just having a conversation with him. We told him exactly what was going to happen. Okay. So we got him on the table. We prepped him, got him ready. Then we started the procedure. The way a heart catheterization works is that the anterior artery, your femoral artery, okay, where your groin is, because it's one of the easiest palpable superficial artery that can, we can access without having to literally cut the patient open. So we go in with catheters, wires, different things. It's just basically a long tube that we stick in the groin. It goes up the abdominal aorta, up the arch, descending aorta into in where the heart is. Okay? So we'll, we'll, we will cannulate the tube into one of the vessels and we just start shooting contrast in there so we can now visualize it under x-ray, okay? The moment we injected the first contrast, we're just talking about two or three cc's, it's nothing. Two or three cc's, that's like a teaspoon, okay? We were all looking at the monitor, his EKG monitor, and all of a sudden he started to defibrillate. His eyes rolled back, his pressure dropped. When your pressure drops below 60, that means your heart isn't pumping uh, adequate amounts of blood throughout your body. His, okay, remember normal is about 90-ish, right? Okay, he was below 60. There isn't enough pressure there to pump the heart. Next thing we know, he goes into V-fib, and we're performing CPR on the table. Okay, we're performing CPR on the table and here we are doing chest compressions on him, okay? And as we're doing that, I'm looking at the monitor, the first angiogram that they took, his heart was normal, okay? We did CPR on this guy for 45 minutes, and we called him dead after 45 minutes. Time of death, we couldn't bring him back to life. First injection, he had a severe systemic reaction. It happened within seconds. All this happened and we couldn't do anything about it, okay? So when we're talking about severe, you better be ready, okay? Any of these symptoms, if they start to manifest themselves, you need to stop what you're doing, okay? The doctor is usually in the room after the first uh, five minutes or so just to make sure that our patient isn't having any type of anaphylactic reaction. Okay. So, before beginning a procedure such as the one I described, you're going to make certain the crash cart is stopped and all emergency medications and equipment is up to date. Remember the crash cart check we talked about last week, making sure that it hasn't been tampered with? that the, the locks have not, been, have not been broken. We do an inventory check to make sure that everything is there, okay? This is something that you should do, not only in the beginning of the day, but also before you start one of these procedures. Number two, ask the patient the following questions. Ms. Jones, are you allergic to any foods or medi medications? If so, what are they? Do you have asthma or hay fever? Have you ever had hives or other allergic skin reactions? Have you ever had an exam using contrast media? Did you have a reaction to that following the exam? These are some just basic questions that we ask our patients to help us 
to assess our patient better to make sure that the reactions on the previous page don't happen. And then I will also ask him, were you premedicated the night before? Did you take your Benadryl this morning? Okay. Do not leave the patient alone. Stop the injection or infusion immediately and notify the radi radiologist if any of those things start to occur. Remember, when somebody starts to cough or sneeze, I'll be like, are you okay? Is everything okay? Then what I'll do is I'll lower their gown and I'm gonna start looking at their chest and their neck to see if they've broken out in any hives. If they're just sneezing and coughing, okay, no hives, I'm gonna stand back a little bit and I'm gonna keep checking on them. Are you still doing okay? You're still doing okay? So if the patient complains of itching, redness, or swelling of the skin, or the patient seems unduly or anxious, be ready. If the patient complains of respiratory distress, or any symptoms, call the emergency team. What is the emergency team? You guys remember the very first slide that we looked at last week? Remember the codes? I'm going to get on the horn, and I'm going to call a code blue. Okay? It's better to be safe than sorry. Have them there, because right now the symptoms are showing. I'm gonna have them come here and be ready. Because once it goes from mild to moderate, you're gonna be in trouble. And you better be ready to you know, put on your skates, put on your skates and be ready to do what you can. As clinicians in our specific area, our scope of practice is just being, being able to know where the medications are located, where any accessories are located, oxygen tubing, IVs, anything of that nature. So that way if the doctor or the nurse asks for a specific item, you know where, we, where to retrie retrieve it. So you're going to be ready to assist. Okay? But your, your skill doesn't stop there. Okay? What's going to happen is that you may be the one doing the chest compressions. You may not be able to administer medication and things like that, but can you do CPR? Mm -hmm. Yes, you can do CPR. And that's what you're going to do. You're going to perform CPR. You're going to be ready to perform the defibrillator if you need to. You guys remember the defibrillator that sends a shock through the patient's body with the paddles? You're going to be doing that. Those are things that you can do, and you have to be prepared to do that. Okay? We can also, while we're waiting, we can put the patient in a semi fowler's position. What's semi fowler's? Seated up at an angle. Seated up. Just sit them up. Okay? <clears throat> the whole purpose of them sitting up is remember your, your body is getting deprived of oxygen, your heart especially. So we're going to sit you up. The patient is still conscious, guys. They're, they're not unconscious. Most of the time when they're going into a, a cardiac arrest, 